Welcome to this panel discussion from Online Educators in Process Dynamics and Control. My name is John Hedengren, and I'm an associate professor at Brigham Young University. With courses moving online, university instructors are suddenly tasked with developing weeks of online content. Brian Douglas, Jeffrey Cantor, Stephen Bruton, and John Anthony Rossetier have joined us today to discuss online resources and advice for faculty and students in distance education. We will have brief presentations from each and followed by a panel discussion with a period for questions from the audience. The session is sponsored by the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, Computing and Systems Technology Division, and CASH, or CASH, or Computer Aids for Chemical Engineering, is a not-for-profit organization whose purpose is to promote cooperation among universities, industry, and government in the development and distribution of computer-related and or technology-based educational aids for the chemical engineering profession. We have a, a bio for each one. Let me go ahead and just cover our panel discussion uh, speakers today. Brian Douglas is an aerospace engineer with 17 years of experience in designing and testing spacecraft guidance, navigation, and control systems. He makes educational videos on control theory for his YouTube channel, Control Systems Lectures, and for the MathWorks Tech Talk series. Stephen Bruton is an Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Washington and Adjunct Associate Professor of Applied Mathematics and a Data Science Fellow at the eScience Institute. Steve received a PhD in Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering from Princeton University in 2012. His research combines machine learning with dynamical systems to model and control systems in a variety of areas. He is a co-author of three textbooks and has received numerous research and teaching awards. John Anthony Rossetier is in the Automatic Control and Systems Engineering Department at the University of Sheffield. He has taught for nearly 30 years and with a particular focus on modeling and analysis control. He received his doctorate from Oxford University in 1990. He has received a number of awards for teaching as well as publishing extensively in the academic literature, mainly in the field of predictive control. He is currently chair of both IFAC and IEEE Technical Committees on Control Education. And our last panel discussion member is Jeffrey Cantor. He is a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Notre Dame. He received his PhD from Princeton in 1981. He served as the vice president and associate provost, vice president for graduate studies and research, and the dean of graduate, the graduate school at Notre Dame. His interest he is interested in the analysis and optimization of integrated financial and process operations using methods of stochastic control, convex optimization, and quantitative finance. So with that, let's go ahead and welcome our speakers, and we will start with Brian Douglas. All right. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me on and to the other panelists here. I think this is going to be kind of interesting. I got, a, I got a little bit excited when I made this presentation, and so... Uh, it's, it's, uh, let's see here. Whoops. It's probably a bit more than I need to talk about. Um, but I'm going to try to jam it all into 10 minutes. And so I'm going to talk really quickly. Um, and if you need more information, you can contact me down at the bottom or we can do question and answer and all sorts of things, but I'm going to try to cover three things. Uh, one's just a fact. It's just the content that I've created. Uh, and then I wanted to go over two opinions, which, uh, is like how videos can play a part in education, but not necessarily, I think, the whole thing. And, and then the third thing is just how much good information there already is out there, and that we may just have a uh, curation problem more so than, you know, you know creating more content. Uh, so I mostly, at the moment, make videos. Uh, I have my own YouTube channel, Control System Lectures. Uh, it's mostly classical control theory, uh, frequency domain methods. And then for about the last year and a half, two years or so, uh, I've been working with MathWorks to help create some of their MATLAB Tech Talk videos. Same sort of idea. It's this black background, colorful drawings, voiceover type of thing that I did on my channel. And now I get to do that for the MathWorks channel as well. Um, I borrowed this from Khan Academy. I thought this was a really good visual to sort of tell the stories that I wanted to tell. And all of these videos are online and free and can be used and sliced up and all of that kind of stuff. Um, there's a, 
the different uh, links to get to them. But in addition to just videos, um, I've written a few eBooks or at least part of eBooks. Um, there's the fundamentals of control theory. It's only the first three chapters and I kind of ran out of time to create that, but that's up on my website and that's a creative commons license. So you can take that and chop it up and use it in your, in whatever presentations and, and, and things that you need to. Uh, and then I've written two for MathWorks. Uh, this, this one, which is a reinforcement learning from a control systems engineer's perspective is fully posted on, on the MathWorks website. It's available for download again for free and can be used, um, you know, to help, to help teach, uh, you know, reinforcement learning. And then, uh, there's another one on sensor fusion and tracking, but only the first part of that has been posted. The other two are going to probably post later this year. The thing I'm working on right now is I'm trying to figure out how to tie all of this information together. And so uh, I've been building up this map of control theory and actually John and Steve have both contributed to helping me craft this. Um, they've provided a bunch of feedback. And what I was trying to do is tie together all of the different theory that and algorithms and processes and approaches and techniques and all of this stuff that we hear about when we're trying to learn control theory but might not understand how it all relates to each other. Um, I just posted this on LinkedIn on Friday and it's been viewed over 200,000 times. And so as you can imagine, I've received a lot of feedback on how to make this better. So there's probably gonna be another version of this coming out in, I don't know, whenever I have time, a month or so. Um, but this is what I'm working on now and I'll get back to this in just a second. So, Mostly, like I said, mostly what I do is I make videos and I think videos are awesome. Um, and I guess I, I just wanted to have a, a bit of a word of caution about videos though, because I've gotten requests from some people that says, hey, I want to build a course around your videos, or I just want to show all my students all of your videos. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily a good idea. Uh, and with one caveat here is I'm not a professional educator. I don't teach any classes, uh, all of the other panelists here are much more qualified to talk on this than I am. So uh, just take my opinions with a grain of salt that uh, it's not my full-time job to figure out how to bring these students up to becoming you know, uh, good control systems engineers. So when I create my videos, I was trying to figure out where, those, where it fits in to the whole grand scheme of learning. Uh, what was I trying to do when I made these videos? And I kind of came up with this sort of unscientific theory of learning just based on my opinion, is I thought, well, videos are good to introduce a topic. They produce, you know, they do a fast introduction. I can tie a bunch of concepts together, ignite this interest in learning. And they're also good for just general lecturing, you know, just going through some sort of topic, going through proofs and things like that. Um, but it doesn't really replace, I don't think, like an instructor-led classroom. You know, it's important for to have somebody there to guide and answer questions, make sure that the students are going along the right path, uh, challenging their knowledge, and giving an opportunity for the students to experience group dynamics, which I think is also really, really important. Uh, one of the things I have a trouble with is if somebody's just constantly spouting information at me in a video or in a classroom, I feel like I'm getting it. I feel like I understand everything. It's like, oh, this all makes so much sense. And it's only after when I go to try it on my own that I realize I didn't get any of that. And so there's still this focused contemplation portion where you read the textbook and you do homework problems and you try to form your own understanding by yourself in, you know, in quiet. Um, and then lastly, I think labs and working with hardware is really, really important also for, for learning this type of, of engineering. Um, gives you a chance to solve these practical problems that we don't necessarily cover in theory alone. So with this in mind, my videos focus on those three things almost exclusively. Uh, I'm mostly just trying to get people interested in learning and not focusing on giving, you know, teaching them all of the information that they need to know. And so if you base a course around my videos, or I think a, lo a lot in videos in, in general, you're gonna miss out on a whole bunch of stuff as a student, and it's not going to be a very complete uh, learning experience. And so these, I, I tend to say that my videos are more supplements to these other kind of more traditional learning um, techniques. 
luckily there's a whole bunch of different types of videos out there. Um, you know, there's these sort of pop science and engineering ones, which is kind of fun and in introducing high level concepts. There's a ton of demonstration videos out there that researchers, once they have an end product, they just show it off. Um, a lot of classroom lectures, and then what I call video lectures, which is people who are crafting a story specifically for video. It's not just they recorded a classroom lecture and then put it up on YouTube. And all of these are good and can be used in some way to sort of tell this story that we want to tell. But in addition to videos, we've got tons and tons of textbooks out there. Some are free, some cost a lot of money. There's a lot of good information in textbooks, obviously. Um, we have a ton of peer reviewed papers. Some of them are absolutely worth reading no matter what, because they're just really well written and uh, there's a lot of information in them. We've got entire like online courses, you know, like the MOOC from MIT, the edX or individual professors have gone on and put their entire course online. So there's a, there's a ton of information about how we structure a class also on, uh, on the internet. Uh, blogs. I go to tons of blogs all the time to, to learn something and I have some that I've just bookmarked forever because they're just so well written and uh, there's a lot of information stored away in blogs on the internet. One thing that I don't think we use enough is sort of these do-it-yourselfers and project pages that exist online uh, like BPS Space, Joe Barnard. He builds thrust vector controlled flying machines and he's not a control systems engineer by education, but he is going through and developing a GNC system for real hardware and making mistakes along the way. And he just has a ton of videos that are really good to explain some of the pitfalls that you're going to come across when you're trying to design something yourself and how do you test something. And then, you know, hack a day and instructables. And there's just a bunch of project instruction websites out there as well. Uh, people are building hardware kits, cheap hardware kits that are specifically aimed towards education. You know, John's got his temperature control lab, Plum Geek Robotics has these little tiny robots that have a bunch of sensors and actuators on them. Uh, there's a lot of apps out there. Kwanzer has experience controls, which is on, you know, phones and tablets, and then a whole bunch just through a, a browser, uh, like this Desmos, which is visualizing math. So bunch of apps out there that can help uh, software, uh, you know, like GitHub and, and other places where software repositories live. People develop things like this tiny EKF, which is this lightweight extended Kalman filter written in C and C++ for, you know, people can download source code and see how it's created or just use it in their projects themselves. And uh, let's see, lastly, there's a whole bunch of like online communities also like Reddit and Quora and stuff where people go and they ask questions and experts in the field come back and they answer those questions. And a lot of times those answers are fantastic, well-written, well-researched, uh, well-presented. And so there's a bunch of things um, already out there all around. And I think a course could be all of this stuff plus live you know, presentations and things like that. We don't have to rely just on videos and then sending them off to a textbook or something like that. And this is, I guess, might be a little bit much to say next week we have to do all of this, but this is the type of thing that I would love to see online courses start adapting is not to create all this stuff themselves, but to pull from a whole bunch of different sources that already exist online. So this is the last chart here, but I feel that it's a bit inefficient that everybody always go out and create their own content. Um, and it also seems inefficient to curate your own list from scratch. There's a lot of lists out there and a lot of content. And the hard part is content gets created every single day. And that content sometimes is better than what already exists and needs to go on that list. And so these lists are living things. Uh, so this is one of the things I'm trying to figure out going forward is, what does this hub for curated learning materials look like? Um, I'm, I'm biased towards free accessibility, clarity of presentation. I want this to, 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 to be something that people can go and say, oh, here's this map, let's say. Um, and I want to build a lesson around LQR control. So within LQR control, there's a lot of textbooks and chapters and videos and peer reviewed papers and DIYs and software and blog, all of that stuff. Just a lot of good information out there. 
And that way a professor or somebody who wants to develop a course around it can come and say, these are the specific things that I want to add into my course. And then I want to fill in the gaps with my own stuff, but I'm going to tie it all together in this way. Um, I think would be a, an interesting resource and something that we could all use to kind of help pull more things online for this education. Lastly, I just have these little blue up arrows. Um, I, in my head, I have this vision of a Reddit style voting system mixed with a wiki style <laughs> uh, list that just sort of self curates itself over time. But that's a completely different story. Um, I only had one more picture here. This I'm not going to talk about, but this is my setup. And if you have questions about it, I've made a video on how I make videos, but it's basically just drawing with a tablet in Photoshop, capturing the screen, putting it into a video editing program, and then doing a voiceover. So next, um, we're going to go ahead and move on to uh, Stephen uh, uh, to be able to share some of his thoughts. Okay, excellent. And hopefully uh, everyone can see my video. Hi. Um, so first off, I think that Brian's suggestion is absolutely fantastic. I love kind of this uh, map with these individual sections that you can build out all of these resources. I think that this is what great educators have been doing forever, is going out and finding kind of base materials, uh, you know, some hardcore technical lectures, some really interesting research problems, some current events and kind of curating this into their own story to get students excited and carry them along with the material. So I think, you know, Brian has a fantastic idea about how to do this uh, kind of online uh, in the 21st century. So I love it. Um, I'm going to share my screen a little and just walk you through kind of a little bit of my content. Um, so I'm going to do something kind of similar to, to what Brian did. I'm going to walk through just a little bit of kind of what content I have online for, uh, for control theory specifically. I'll tell you a little bit about my setup and then I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about just kind of general philosophy of uh, kind of how I think about education and, and how to curate material. Um, so maybe I'll actually go to this one first. So on my YouTube page, um, I have a bunch of playlists and one of them that I think is most relevant here is this control boot camp. Um, so I'm just going to view full playlist here. Um, so you can see kind of this is, I would estimate maybe six hours, uh, four to six hours of control theory essentials. Um, essentially I created this because I was finding that my graduate students, when they were coming into my lab, even if they had had some controls classes before, they weren't really kind of learning the essential content that I wanted them to know. Uh, and so this starts off, I would say this is at kind of the senior undergrad or first year graduate level, assuming the students have ordinary differential equations. Um, if you like, this is kind of the uh, Asterman Murray uh, style where you start off with state space systems, um, you know, ODEs, and you just go from there. And so we do get into frequency domain towards the end of the class, but really as a way to understand robust control systems. Uh, and so this is what I consider, I call it a boot camp because it's very condensed. It's, you know, the bare essentials that I wanted my students to know in a very, very short amount of time. Um, so I would also point out, uh, just seconding, seconding what, what Brian said earlier, you know, this is absolutely not enough to fill an entire class. This is topical, high-level intro material. Uh, there are a few places where it dives down in some technical depth but this is probably a third of a full control theory class. So you'd need to beef that up with papers and texts and homeworks. And, um, you know, this is, this is enough to be, to make the students dangerous. They kind of know where to look. Um, but I think they need more to become a true, a true expert. Uh, so, okay. So this is kind of the most relevant class, the control boot camp. Uh, there are tons of other kind of, videos just about general applied math that students would need to know. So if they need to know linear algebra or singular value decompositions or just engineering math in general, uh, all of those videos are here. Something I want to point out is that all of these videos and especially the control bootcamp follow from a recent book uh, that was written by myself and Nathan Kutz. So this is uh, data-driven science and engineering and we have a book website databookuw.com. 
if you typed in uh, databook.pdf here, you can download the full PDF copy of this book. Um, so, so these links are, uh, are also in the YouTube comments. So I'm just gonna walk you through a little bit of the material on this book because we tried to make this as useful for online education as possible. So first off, we have code and data for every chapter of the book in MATLAB and in Python. So you can walk through my control bootcamp, I believe is chapter eight. And so uh, in fact, you can go here, part three dynamics and control, chapter eight linear control theory. And now you can actually see kind of how I organize all of this content uh, in sections and in parts corresponding to the book. So you can download the code, you can download the book PDF, and then you can actually walk through uh, these videos kind of in progression. Uh, and you can do that for all of the different parts of the book. You know, chapter one is singular value decomposition, which of course is important for control theory. Um, okay, good. So that's kind of the content. Um, I would also point out uh, just a little bit about how the setup is made. This is what, what we use to make these videos is called a Lightboard Studio. And essentially it consists of a large piece of construction glass on a mount uh, with side lighting so that you can write on the glass. And it's a little hard to see here. Let me see if I can get a nice picture. Um, you can actually see this is a studio right here where you have a camera facing uh, the, the lecturer. The lecturer is writing normally facing the camera and then either in software or in hardware that image is flipped and you can superimpose PowerPoint or MATLAB so you can do live coding, uh, which, is, which is pretty cool. So these studios are relatively inexpensive. Uh, you can build one for as cheap as probably $10,000, um, and the upper end is maybe 30 or 40 grand. And this does not require a film crew. So you can go in on the mornings or on the weekends or in the evenings, you turn this on in about five minutes and you're filming and you can create your own content. Um, if you don't happen to have a Lightboard Studio, you can also do a lot uh, just with like QuickTime. If you're, I'm working on a Mac right now, so if I open up QuickTime Player, uh, if you go to File, New Screen Recording or New Movie Recording, you can actually record exactly what's on your screen. And for example, I can fire up a copy of MATLAB or, or a Jupyter Notebook, and I can you know, open up a Skype window or a Zoom window just like we're doing here, and I can live code with a picture of, of my camera actually, you know, me talking you through the code on my screen. So you can actually create your own uh, video recordings like that, which I think is pretty, pretty cool if you wanna do it on the cheap. Um, good, so that's kind of the content. Um, maybe I'll just talk a little bit about flipping classes because we've done this uh, before for, um, in fact, actually one of these playlists um, will be, I think, AMAS 301. Um, yeah, so this engineering mathematics, ME 564 and 565, and a couple of other classes at UW, we've actually flipped. Also this data science for biologists class. Um, and I think this is really important uh, when you're flipping a class, uh, and, and Brian, I think summarized this, or, or kind of outlined this beautifully, that there's a lot of opportunity to actually grow your class and grow the base where you're drawing content from and make it a rich experience. But that's still on the, on the professor as the curator to kind of curate this content in a, in a nice cohesive uh, kind of journey that you're taking the student on. And so, you know, I think it's good to review just what you want out of a class in general. So in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, first and foremost, you want to get the students excited. Because if they're not excited and they don't think that this is valuable, they're not gonna listen, they're not gonna tune in, especially online. You know, it's so easy to just put yourself on mute and turn your, your screen off and just go space off and do your own thing, right? So you have to keep your students excited and engaged. Uh, you wanna give them a lay of the land. So that um, map of control theory is kind of the perfect uh, example of this, is giving your students the lay of the land. You don't have to go into full technical depth on every single one of those topics, but you have to teach your students how to know where to look when they have questions and know how to build their own knowledge. So I think that's, that's what we do as instructors is we teach by example, we show them how to kind of build up a knowledge base uh, from that, that big you know, mile high view and then start to zoom in and, and build up the content. So if done you know, correctly and, and with, with kind of time invested, 
a flipped classroom can be an extremely rewarding experience for the student and for the professor. You can have more time for group discussions. Uh, my wife just flipped her class and she had a lot of time to actually meet with the student groups uh, who were doing group projects. And so they would present uh, on, on a big Zoom chat to the rest of the class. And so, you know, that could be a couple of two hour lectures where you walk through course projects and really give uh, detailed feedback to everyone. Something you wouldn't necessarily have time to do if you were packing in, you know, 30 hours of lecture content. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that, that's the high level summary. I mean, we've already been doing a lot of this for Boeing. So we're creating a lot of this content for Boeing specifically. And then Boeing team leaders will essentially curate that content along with other content like case studies within the company or news articles and, and you know, uh, hackathons and code boot camps and things like that. So they'll curate their own um, you know, high level kind of courses and we contribute some of this online educational material. Um, okay, so I think that's pretty much it for me. Um, you know, you want to get your students excited, you want to give them the lay of the land, and you want to teach them how to kind of build up their own knowledge. Uh, and I think you can do that online or, or in person. Thanks, Steve. This is Thank really you. valuable content. And I especially like that you, you know, talked about how both you, uh, you know, and Brian talked about how you create the videos or you curate them and some of your thoughts about that. So thank you. Okay, on to uh, Jeff. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Uh, I hope you can all see me now. Am I on? Yep, yeah, it looks good. Okay, great. great, well, 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 thank you, John. And um, I, I am totally taken by the first two presenters. I learned so much from them about and, and the framework within which they've cast this discussion of curation of finding resources and making it available to students. Um, the challenge I have is that, I, that um, like many, so many universities, we're moving to fully online education next week. And so we have a challenge, uh, an individual challenge and a university challenge of taking uh, uh, 10,000 students and converting them from, an, from a, a, classroom, uh, a classroom experience to an online experience. And like so many of my colleagues, I feel under the gun and I'm rapidly looking for resources and finding, um, trying to find a new paradigm to, to bring this material to the students. For the last three years, I've been developing a set of Jupyter Python notebooks, which I intend to be, which will now be the basis for my, for the online experience I intend to provide students. Um, I'm going to post on the chat window a link to a set of some content that I've developed over the last few years. And if, um, and now let me share the screen. Okay, um, what you see there is a set of, of links to GitHub repositories. Each of them consists of a set of notebooks organized in a book-like metaphor. Uh, under the utilities tab, you'll see there's a, 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 a um, repository called NB Pages. That's a Python project that I used, uh, that I developed, that allows you to maintain a collection of notebooks in a chapter-like format. So what you do is you organize your notebooks into a directory, um, preface each of the notebook names with a chapter and section number, and then use this utility to uh, create a collection of notebooks which have a uniform, um, a uniform header, a uniform um, footnote, uh, navigation links, creates a table of contents, and uh, otherwise makes um, a whole collection of notebooks manageable as a unified resource. And so over time, I've developed uh, four of these, and currently I have underway a fifth, uh, which is um, a chemical process control laboratory built around the temperature control laboratory that uh, John and his team have, have uh, provided to the community. Um, Jeff, you can I'm, now uh, control my screen if you'd like to. Oh, I can. Okay, great. Um, so, for example, if you click, I'm clicking on the link, um, the chemical process control link, and you can see an example of this collection of notebooks. It's organized with a table of contents, chapters. Each of the chapter sections is itself a uh, is itself a notebook, and these can be, for example, I'll just pick one. Uh, and these can be uh, notebooks can be opened in uh, Google Collaboratory, uh, so you can interact with it and run the code online using the Google servers, or you can choose to download it and run it locally uh, in your own Python environment, typically an Anaconda environment. So they're usable in a couple of different ways. So uh, what I've also developed in addition to these 
is, is a, another collection of notebooks. This is what we call, what I'm calling the process control laboratory. And what these are, are notebooks that can be run locally and um, interface with the temperature control laboratory. So let me just click on the first to demonstrate that. And what you do here is you, um, uh, the students connect their, their laptops through a USB cable to the temperature control lab. And then by going through these notebooks, they can run all kinds of hands-on experiments. They can develop, um, they can take measurements, they can uh, fit models to the, to the measured data, they can build uh, con simple controllers, like, such as relay controllers, BID controllers. Um, they can do state estimation, and then uh, even we move on to predictive control. So that's all in this collection of notebooks. And what I'll be doing for the spring is, uh, with John's help, um, we're going to be mailing this week uh, a, a, a hardware, uh, the temperature control hardware, to each of the students enrolled. And we're going to be doing an online hands-on laboratories. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, yeah, I think have, it's 80 students, right? So quite a few. Students. And uh, we'll have TAs uh, locally, uh, so we can break this um, these 80 students up into uh, different laboratory sections, each overseen by a, by a TA. And, uh, and we'll do the interaction via Zoom, and students be, be at home being able to interact with us, with TAs, and, and doing this set of experiments. So that's the hands-on portion of what we'll be doing uh, this spring. Uh, in addition to that, I'll be doing some synchronous style um, interaction with students via Zoom. And one of the, and one of, uh, and I intend to use notebooks for presenting, um, presenting much of this material. Okay, and so this is a notebook that I developed uh, for an in-class exercise uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I was at a point in the course where I was, had just completed a unit on linear modeling, the dynamics of linear systems. We're going to move on to the to nonlinear systems and the idea and the concept of linearizing around an operating point. And I thought, given the news of the day, that um, a simple epidemiological compartment style model for the COVID um, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic introduced students to the idea of modeling. They had already seen how to um, do simulation in a Python-like environment. So they knew how to write a system with differential equations, integrate that, present the results using uh, elementary graphics. And so what this presentation, um, the purpose of this presentation was to show a bit more complex example that had a little bit more complex dynamics. Okay, and, and so uh, this is an example of a notebook being opened in Colab. Um, this, is, uh, this is Python operated inside a browser using Google servers to provide the computational um, the computational service. And uh, the way the Google Colab works is that uh, interactive simulation can be done through a series of, of tools. Uh, and in this case, what I've done is I put a, uh, behind the screen is Python code. And what I have in front of the screen are a set of sl sliders that allow you to choose values for key parameters in the model. The reproduction number in an epidemiological model, the reproduction number is one of the one of the key parameters, and so that's a number we can choose here. Um, if, we, for example, we're choosing the value of 2.4, what this refers to um, are the number of people that would be infected by an index zero patient in a totally susceptible population. Then we could put in certain, uh, establish certain disease parameters like the the, the period of incubation um, um, during which time a, a, a patient, uh, an infected individual, is asymptomatic. And then a, a subsequent period of when they reach an infectious state and can infect others. Um, the, this model is for a campus-like setting, so we can choose the size of the campus here, about 14,000, which is the size of our Notre Dame campus. And you can, cho can choose um, uh, a, a number of, of, an, of people who are initially exposed in our campus. And then you can explore the question of the issue of, of the effectiveness of social distancing. This is a control parameter, and um, when I gave the presentation to the class, I described this as uh, the point at which we can do control. Then running this, um, you can see you can see how this you can see various projections. Um, in this case, what you can see is an evolution. Uh, the, the blue bar is, refers to the uh, susceptible population. And you can see how that diminishes over time. 
you can see in these intermediate bars the um, the number of individuals who are exposed and not yet infective, and in the green bar, the number of individuals who are now infected, and then in the red bar, those who um, who, who recover. And in the chart below, um, you can see a comparison between the case where there's no social distancing and social distancing, uh, and um, then you can see the flattening of the curve. Um, I gave this presentation to the students about two weeks ago. Um, as you might expect, it created a lot of buzz among the students. It also created a lot of buzz at our university. Um, I learned later that our that um, the university leadership used this model in coming to some of the decisions that they did. Among them was a decision that social distancing on a campus um, isn't likely to be effective enough to reduce the demand for, for uh, health services during the spring term. And so out of, a, out of a, an abundance of caution, um, our leaders decided to close our campus uh, beginning uh, this week and uh, moving on to online education. Uh, I'm not, and I also learned later that the same model was used at the University of Minnesota and a few hospitals in Minnesota to establish what uh, their plans for the next few weeks. So um, uh, I'm presenting this to you as a as a as a twofer, um, an example of of how to use a Python notebook within a class to demonstrate some ideas and, co and control uh, the materials that I've created. In addition to that, uh, to round out a control course and um, and to give you a a tool to explore what might be in our future in the near term. So with that, I'll turn back to John. Wow, thank you. Thanks for that effective uh, you know, presentation about how to take a control and dynamics problem and, and really make it come alive with you know current events. So thank you for that. Okay, so John Anthony, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to you now. Uh, I'll do what I prepared and then I'll add a couple of minutes on the end which relates to what the other authors have talked about. Uh, this is gonna be quite a radical change in direction initially. So you'll see I'm gonna talk about MATLAB GUIs to create virtual labs. I'll be relatively quick. Is it, is it listening to me? Right, okay. So why virtual laboratories? Uh, you're probably aware pre and post laboratory activities give students time to reinforce their learning and experiment more freely because they have limited time with hardware in practice. So I quite like virtual labs because they're cheap um, I'm not in America, and in the UK, we don't have nearly as much money, um, so things have to be cheap. Uh, they're available 24-7 to the entire cohort who can use them simultaneously, and so they're a lot more accessible than remote labs or hardware in general. And you can make them pseudo-authentic, and so they're still quite useful for learning. Okay, next question, why MATLAB? Well, maybe this is my British... Um, background. Academic staff have got limited time and expertise and usually no money. Okay, so in the UK, we don't usually have any money for such things. So most engineering academics are familiar with coding in MATLAB. So they can create um, virtual labs quickly and for free. Okay. Um, and accessibility. Generally speaking, in British universities, MATLAB is available. So if you do something on MATLAB, the students can access it. Okay, and you'll notice what I put down at the bottom, better to give some students something cheap and simple and accessible than nothing at all. So even though there are much better software tools that work much better on the web, et cetera, et cetera, they cost money, they're a lot harder to code, and it's basically that's giving a big obstacle to most academic stuff, which they wouldn't be able to get over. Okay, so I've got some simple examples here, and you'll see that most of these take about half a day to a whole day to prepare. So it's not a lot of time. And that includes supporting notes and guidance for the user. So this one just slightly more slowly, it's on a, a tank level scenario. So you can see the simple picture. Yes, it's not a real picture, but the students get the idea. There is some underlying mathematics. I'm not going to dwell on it. This slide just to show you what the maths is. That will be in the supporting notes if you want to read it. And this is what the GUI looks like. And you can see it's relatively simple. Okay, it's got a few sliders and other things that students can change. And I'll demonstrate 
um, at the end. The key thing is that things move. So it's pseudo authentic. So the students can say, yeah, I can relate to that. It looks a bit like a tank. I can see things moving. I can change some key um, parameters and see what goes on. Here's a separate, another GUI. This is a mixing tank. Um, what happens in this mixing tank is basically the colors change. So you see the, the uh, plots move slowly. You can overlay plots as you change flow rates, change concentrations, um, change tank volumes and things of that nature, and the colors change. House temperature. Um, here again, you can see the line plots change, the color of the house changes. So the students can get an idea of what's going on, but these things don't take a huge amount of effort to build. And last one here is a heat exchange. And I've got lots of these. So what I thought would be better would be to demonstrate a couple. And you'll notice I've started with aeroplane landing and that one really is to have a bit of fun. Um, it's not overly serious and a cruise control. If you want to see uh, lots of the GUIs, you'll see I've put a website here, I'll show you that in the end, and you can go and basically download these and give them to your students to use. So I'll demonstrate here. So what I need to do is find MATLAB. Let's hope uh, you can all see this. So this is a very simple one. You can see it's got three sliders, mass, um, um, stiffness and damping. Um, you can do what you like with these. It's meant to be a bit of fun. You'll notice it's a place where students can actually enter their name. That's just to demonstrate if you wanted to use these things for assignments, make sure it's the student's own work, get them to put their name in there so that they've at least done something themselves. Press there to run and you'll see the key thing is it's not really an aeroplane, it's a passenger in a seat. But you see the passenger bouncing up and down. It's the sort of thing you can use in a lecture, um, change the mass, change the stiffness, run it again. And the idea is that it's just a bit of fun, get students to see, is that a comfortable landing or not? Are you happy? So that one's meant to be a bit of fun. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is just open a different one now. So if I stop share, oh, there we are, it's started now. Okay, so you can see, I've changed the target speed and you'll see the car is beginning to move and you can see the uh, what's happening to the throttle and what's happening to the, uh, um, I can now do things like I can change the slope on the road. So after you update parameters, it takes a few seconds and then it uh, shouldn't be quite that slow. It's normally quicker than this. Uh, obviously it doesn't like the interface. So at some point, this slope will change. I don't know why it's waiting. It's, um, yeah, it might be something with the screen sharing, but. Uh... but yeah, I think, I think so. Um, something's not. It's, oh, there, it's waking up now. It's not woken. Oh, there you are. So can you see there's now a slope? Okay, usually it happens after a couple of seconds and you'll see the car stop moving. Um, and what that, that's sort of demonstrating, you introduce this disturbance and your proportional control, which wasn't very good to start with, is even less effective now. So we can introduce a bit of PI and stuff update parameters. But you see, the whole idea is they're relatively simple, these GUIs, but it allows students to quickly engage with, hey, this is a real environment. These are the sorts of things I have to deal with. I can press these buttons and I can investigate what happens with different decisions. Okay, obviously that's not working brilliantly. So what I'll do is I'll stop share and then I will go to a different window. Um, and show you now, where would it be? I need to go to the web page. Where is the web page going to be? It's not there. Is it that one? Hopefully. So, can you see, um, can you see my browser now? Uh, not yet, you may have to share your screen again. Okay. Um, all right, let's go back in there. there so you are. I press, right, so you can see it now, can you? Mm -hmm. So, so it hasn't got all the ones that my students can see, but you'll see here, I've got a number of different GUIs, different uh, scenarios. And 
if people want these, you'll see there's PDF files, which basically explain what's the mathematics and engineering behind the GUI, a P file and a FIG file. You take those, you can run them. So the idea is the students can just take these, they can all run them whenever they want, and you can integrate them into your lectures and your assignments and your tutorials, just to make sure the students do things. And it's pseudo authentic. And the key thing is they're cheap. Okay. Um, Perhaps just to finish, what you can probably notice is this is a website. Um, so a bit like um, everybody else was il illustrating. Uh, it's not quite like a book, but this is my website where I've produced lots of resources on different things, mostly simple control courses, different chapters. You can go to different chapters, go to different topics, and there's a number of resources, PDF files and YouTube videos. Um, so it's Basically, it's open access. Um, anybody who wants to use this, you'll see there's the web address at the top, um, and it's free to access. But the main the main topic today was obviously potential for these GUIs. Um, the key point being they're cheap. They're cheap and they're quick. And in the UK, I, I noticed other people were making videos you know, that with these smarts, not smart screens, with these with these big glass windows and things like that. It's not really possible in the UK to get facilities like that. So we have to come up with cheaper alternatives. So. Well, very good. Well, thank you so much, uh, John, yeah. for, for that. Yeah. Um, so just, uh, we have time for just a couple questions here. I'm gonna open up the chat window. I've got a couple questions already. And then we'll just let the uh, panelists um, you know, take a turn if they'd like to answer uh, those. Uh, the first one is uh, you shared a lot of excellent resources. What are some methods you've used for assessment? I'll take a shot at that. Um, assessment, um, and that's a, it's a really, it's an excellent question. and. Uh, going forward, when we have to de deliver these classes online, online assessment is a particular challenge. The simple technique that I use is to use our local learning management system, in our case, Sakai, but you could do it with Canvas as well, and just create a set of low stakes quizzes associated with each class um, session. Um, I'm using those in place of a more traditional high stakes testing that you might do at increments during the course. I found that works a lot better. Um, students are reviewing concepts as they go rather than saving it up for a month. And, um, and the response from the students has been great. Yeah, I think I can, I can reiterate that. That's pretty much what we do in Sheffield. We have lots of low stakes quizzes on a, um, a virtual learning environment. Uh, we have Blackboard, <laughs> um, yeah, and basically, get the students to do something every couple of weeks just to make sure they're keeping on top of stuff. So okay. it seems, seems to be quite effective. Okay, well, very good, Steve or Brian, anything else to add? Uh, so, so there is, I think, um, on MathWorks, a MATLAB grader. Um, so, so we've been struggling a little bit with how to do this in Python, but MathWorks for a while has recognized that you need to be able to, um, to kind of assess MATLAB scripts and their outputs um, in, in kind of a grading format. And so if you Google like MathWorks or MATLAB grader, you can find some material on this. Fantastic. Well, thanks. I don't have anything. I don't, I don't do any assessment. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you teach some courses, but uh, probably for more industrial um, participants. Well, great. Uh, thank you for that. I've got another question here uh, or a comment as well. I really like the control map from Brian and like the idea that he will link all the good materials and resources to the icons of the future. I can't wait for that. I want to know how to find good materials online before the link map is created. This panel gave me a lot of materials to digest, but if I want to dig further, do all the instructors usually have semantic ways to find more good open resources for their instruction or for the students? Shall I start on that one? I'm going to be a bit negative, but if you're all familiar with IFAC, um, there have been discussions for the last three years about IFAC 
leading the way in terms of having a website which does this curation um, on behalf of the worldwide community. Um, but the difficulty IFAX got is it has very little cash. And what they discovered is to actually um, run such a site, e even just the costs of having a server and the software was beyond their budget. Um, so it's a great idea which the community really needs, but I think we've got to have somebody who's got enough cash to actually create something sustainable that is then worth the effort of people developing the website itself and doing the curation. And that's, I think, where, you know, the jury's out at the moment. Could I add to that? Um, there's, creation for two, there's curation for two, two different audiences. One audience are people like us who are already steeped in the subject and can evaluate resources and are looking for just exactly the right thing with exactly the right um, coverage for what they're wanting to do. But then there's curation for students who are just starting out in this discipline. And there the challenge is to not give too much, but to really focus and present just the few key ideas. Um, the teaching research shows that if you uh, distract a student with all these kinds of nice to know things, that they lose track of what they need to know. So, um, so as we think about curation, I think it's also really important to think about who are you curating for? That's a great thought, Jeff. I really appreciate that. Okay, any other of our panelists? Okay, I also shared just a link there. I shared it earlier as well, but this is, I think one of the challenges as we go into this is, is how to curate this, you know, for students or instructors. The, the link that I shared is more for instructors. So if you'd like to add links or other things to that list that I posted. Also, I have a directory of faculty who are involved in a system dynamics and control in the process systems area, more from the chemical engineering side, but I'd like to also create this directory and, and also uh, connect faculty uh, together as we go through the shared experience of, of moving online. Uh, so, so please update uh, those lists with anything uh, that you have. Okay, uh, just let's, um, let's see, I've got a couple more questions here. Um, okay, so the Okay, so thank you very much for the wonderful seminar. A question, may the panel help if there are resources available, research papers on experimental equipment for a process control teaching lab. Uh, so the temperature control lab by, uh, by myself has been very valuable for us. So any other labs, uh, I guess in one of the presentations we had uh, an example of that, but any other control teaching labs that you would recommend? Is, is, was that focus on chemical engineering or was it more generic? Uh, yes, uh, chemical engineering, they said. I think the short answer is the world needs a few. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And, you know, there are, there are companies uh, that deliver commercial solutions. Now, those are more... Uh, you know, large scale labs that, you know, where you, you potentially have those in, in a shared laboratory space and then students would, you know, schedule the time to come in and use those. Um, you know, there are also, you know, simple dynamic problems that you can do, you know, just with, uh, you know, simple equipment, uh, like a level control, for example, you could potentially, you know, set that up in a home. The challenge is, instrumentation and actuators and, and how you make those happen. So a lot of a lot of very interesting content, you know, Arduino forums and others that um, and, and I guess I'll just share one thing. I the very first time we did temperature control lab, I had my students try to build those themselves and I torpedoed the class uh, because they um, they they got wiring wrong and other things, even though I had very detailed instructions for them and gave them all the parts. Uh, you know, having them build something themselves was uh, extremely challenging, at least for chemical engineering students. Uh, so I, I guess I just caution uh, if you are going to try to do that, 
there are some instructors like Anthony uh, Butterworth at University of Utah. He has a number of uh, labs that you could build. There's there's others that have uh, labs available. Yeah, I think I, I would repeat. I mean, it's, it sounds a bit um, selfish, but this is partly why I've developed lots of virtual labs because we have hardware laboratory facilities but exactly as you said for interesting chemical engineering problems each lab might cost five or ten thousand pounds and so you can only have three or four or five sets and the students have to queue up and take it in turns to get access to those and so if you want pre and post lab activities or you want to give them extended time virtual laboratories are more accessible and I don't know if you were familiar with the labs that were developed by Graham Goodwin in Australia. It must have been about 10 years ago. Um, but he developed a very extensive and authentic um, virtual lab for chemical engineering. But you, it did have a license fee attached to it. Um, and I think there are a few other examples which are quite impressive. Um, and they sort of get round this issue of we can't have hardware for all chemical engineering problems because it's just too expensive or too slow or too something else. Very good. Okay. Just one final question and then we're just going to uh, wrap up here. Um, I have a question from a student. Um, you know, they just want to understand more deeply control systems and the theory and applications. Um, you know, any final advice? for students that might be listening to this now or watching it later. Uh, we've talked a, a bit about instructor resources. What suggestions do you have as somebody just starting off um, with the material? Um, if I may, and this is based on the teaching I've done over the last couple of years, is if it's a student uh, coming to this topic new and trying to understand, the, uh, understand what's in that control map, um, I'd suggest they get a copy of the Temperature Control Laboratory for $35 from Amazon. They'll sound promotional and it's intended to be that way. And then I uh, get busy. Um, uh, what I find in class is that by putting students in contact with hardware early, the sophistication of their questions just goes through the roof. They, they start with the important questions of what are the significance of constraints? How good are my measurements? What happens um, if my measurements aren't coming in a regular or timely way? they immediately get their hands dirty with real issues of control and don't get bogged down by um, the mathematics of it. So again, they appreciate, I think when you start with hardware, you appreciate that this is a real world engineering discipline. It's not a branch of applied mathematics. I think that's so important for someone starting out. So I'd encourage um, a, a, new stu a student new to this area to get their hands dirty and get a, co a copy of that temperature control lab and get busy with it using the resources that are available on the, on the various uh, websites that are out there. Great, thanks Jeff. Yeah, I definitely second that with, with hardware and just playing with things. Um, it, additionally for me, a lot of the topics that I cover in my videos are things that I've never considered teaching before and haven't even really given an academic thought to. And so I have to do a lot of research myself to get up to speed on these things. And the way I start is just consuming as much material as possible. And if I don't understand it, I just move on and go to the next one and read it, you know, read somebody else's description and I'll get a little bit more bits and pieces because I like their description of one spot here. And then I move on and I read somebody else's. And so by, by looking at a whole lot of different voices describing this one topic, it helps me form my own opinion because no one source has ever really just made something click uh, for, for me. And then when I go back to that first source, after I've done all of that, it usually makes a lot more sense because I've picked up on some of the other things along the way. And, and, and I just kind of circle in by, by consuming as much material as possible and forming an opinion in my head. And so it takes time. Um, it, it, there's, it's not, uh, I wouldn't be able to point to a single source anywhere that says, just read this thing or watch this thing and you're going to get it. Um, it, it takes a little bit of focused effort and, and kind of a wide brush in my mind. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, with, uh, with both of those assessments. Um, I've spent so much time reading about control theory and watching videos from so many different perspectives 
And I think really it's after, you know, the fifth or sixth class that, you know, some of it really started to make sense. So I think because this is somewhere between really applied engineering and really applied mathematics, you know, exposing yourself to all of these perspectives is absolutely critical to, to start to have it, it gel. Um, and I think the recommendation to start with a problem that you're interested in solving. So this is just like computer science. You're gonna learn a programming language so much better if you have a project you wanna, you wanna uh, solve. You wanna enter control theory in the same way. If you have some objective of something you want to actually do, it's gonna be so much more real to you. And you know, if you want to build an experimental, you know, a laboratory set up to do some control, that's great. If you wanna build a simulation to, you know, is invert a pendulum on a cart and stabilize it, that's also great. But, but start off with a, an actual, you know, get your hands dirty kind of a project. Well, fantastic, thank you. Jonathan, you have a final word now if you'd like it. Uh, no, I, I, um, I, quite, I quite like what, what people are saying there. Um, and part of the challenge is uh, if you've got a class of 350 or 400, it's not quite so straightforward to do that. Um, but it, it's the, the principle sounds a good one. It's, um, if, you can, if you can, yeah, start them with hardware, but I think it's not always possible. Well, fantastic. Well, th thanks everybody for joining. Um, and also thank, uh, let's thank our panelists in particular for taking the time to not only share some of their thoughts, but also really think and curate some of their resources that they have available. And, and we will uh, continue to share links. Uh, I'll post those in the description down below. We'll have, um, and we post this to YouTube. And then also if you have other links or other things you'd like to share, you can share those through the, the links on the YouTube video or We'll have some curated lists that Brian mentioned on his blog, or, or we also do some uh, links that I shared in the uh, chat window as well. So, so thanks everybody for joining, and I really appreciate uh, the panelists, so thank you so much.